you are working on a book about, quote, grabby aliens. This is a technical term, like the Big Bang. Uh, yeah. So what are grabby aliens? Grabby aliens expand fast into the universe and they change stuff. That's the key concept. So if they were out there, we would notice. That's the key idea. So the question is, where are the grabby aliens? So Fermi's question is, where are the aliens? And we could vary that in two terms, right? Where are the quiet, hard to see aliens and where are the big, loud, grabby aliens? Mm -hmm. So it's actually hard to say where all the quiet ones are, right? There could be a lot of them out there because they're not doing much. They're not making a big difference in the world. But the grabby aliens, by definition, are the ones you would see. We don't know exactly what they do with where they went, but the idea is they're in some sort of competitive world where each part of them is trying to uh, grab more stuff mm -hmm. and do something with it. And, you know, almost surely whatever is the most competitive thing to do with all the stuff they grab isn't to leave it alone the way it started, right? So we humans, when we go around the earth and, and use stuff, we change it. We, we turn a forest into a farmland, turn a harbor into a city. So the idea is aliens would do something with it. And so we're not sh exactly sure what it would look like, but it would look different. So somewhere in the sky, we would see big spheres of different activity where things had been changed because they had been there. Expanding spheres. Right. So as you expand, you aggressively interact and change the environment. So the word grabby versus loud, you're using them sometimes synonymously, sometimes not. Grabby to me is a little bit more aggressive. What does it mean to be loud? What does it mean to be grabby? What's the difference? And loud in what way? Is it visual? Is it sound? Is it some other physical phenomena like gravitational waves? What Are you using this kind of in a broad philosophical sense or there's a specific thing that it means to be loud in this universe of ours? My co-authors and I put together a paper with a particular mathematical model and so we use the term grabby aliens to describe that more particular model. And the idea is it's a more particular model of the general concept of loud. So loud would just be the general idea that they would be really obvious. Yeah. So grabby is the technical term. Is it in the title of the paper? It's in the body. <laughs> <laughs> the title is actually about loud and okay. quiet. All right. Well, but like so the grabby. idea is there's, there's you know, you, you want to distinguish your particular model of things from the general category of things everybody else might talk about. So that's how we distinguish. The paper title is, If Loud Aliens Explain Human Earliness, Quiet Aliens Are Also Rare. If life on Earth, God, that's such a good abstract. If life on Earth had to achieve and hard, and steps. hard steps to reach humanity's level and the chance of this event rose as time to the nth power. So we'll talk about power, we'll talk about linear increase. So what is the technical definition of grabby? How do you envision grabbiness? And why are, uh, in contrast with humans, why aren't humans grabby? So like, where's that line? Is it well definable? What is grabby, what is not grabby? We have a mathematical model of the distribution of advanced civilizations, i.e. aliens, in space and time. That model has three parameters, and we can set each one of those parameters from data, and therefore we claim this is actually what we know about where they are in space-time. So the key idea is they appear at some point in space-time, and then after some short delay, they start expanding, and they expand at some speed. And the speed is one of those parameters. That's one of the three. And the other two parameters are about how they appear in time. That is, they appear at random places and they appear in time according to a power law. And that power law has two parameters and we can fit each of those parameters to data. And so then we can say, now we know. Mm -hmm. We know the distribution of advanced civilizations in space and time. So we are right now a new civilization and we have not yet started to expand. But plausibly, we would start to do that within, say, 10 million years of the mo current moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's plenty of time. And 10 million years is a really short duration in the history of the universe. So we are, at the moment, a sort of random sample of the kind of times at which an advanced civilization might appear, because we may or may not become grabby, but if we do, we'll do it soon. And so our current date is a sample, and that gives us one of the other parameters. <laughs> the second parameter is the constant in front of the power law, and that's 
arrived from our current date. Mm -hmm. So power law, what is the N in the in the power law? So that's the what is the complicated thing to explain, right? Okay. Advanced life appeared by going through a sequence of hard steps. So right. starting with very simple life, and here we are at the end of this process at pretty advanced life. And so we had to go through some intermediate steps such as you know, sexual selection, photosynthesis, multicellular animals. And the idea is that each of those steps was hard. Uh, evolution just took a long time searching in a big space of possibilities to find each of those steps. And the challenge was to achieve all of those steps by a deadline of when the planets would no longer host uh, simple life. And so Earth has been really lucky compared to all the other billions of planets out there and that we managed to achieve all these steps in this short time of the five billion years that Earth is can support simple life. So not all steps, but a lot of them, because we don't know how many steps there are before you start the expansion. So these are all the steps from right. the birth of life to the initiation of major expansion. Right, so we're pretty sure that it would happen really soon so that it couldn't be the same sort of a hard step as the last one so in terms of taking a long time. So when we look at the history of Earth, we look at the durations of the major things that have happened, that suggests that there's roughly, say, six hard steps that happened, say, between three and 12, and that we have just achieved the last one that would take a long time. Which and, is? Um, well, well, we don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but whatever well, it is, we've just achieved the last one. Are we talking about humans or aliens here? So we'll, let's Earth, talk about humans, some of these right. steps. Yeah. So uh, Earth is really special in some way. We don't exactly know the level of specialness. We right. don't really know which steps were the hardest or not because we just have a sample of one. But you're saying that there's three to 12 steps that we have to go through to get to where we are that are hard steps, hard to find by something that took... Uh, a long time and is unlikely. There's right. a lot of there's a lot of ways to fail. There's a lot more ways to fail than to succeed. The first step would be sort of the very simplest form of life of any sort, and then um, we don't know whether that first sort is the first sort that we see in the historical record or not. Uh, but then some other steps are, say, the development of photosynthesis, the development of sexual reproduction. There's the development of eukaryote cells, which are a certain kind of complicated cell that seems to have only appeared once. And then there's multicellularity, that is multiple cells coming together to large organisms like us. And in this statistical model of trying to fit all these steps into a finite window, the model actually predicts that these steps could be of varying difficulties, that is they could each take different amounts of time on average, but if you're lucky enough that they all appear in a very short time, then the durations between them will be roughly equal. And the time remaining left over in the rest of the window will also be the same length. So we at the moment have roughly a billion years left on Earth until simple life like us would no longer be possible. Life appeared roughly 400 million years after the very first time when life was possible at the very beginning. So those two numbers right there give you the rough estimate of six hard steps just to build up an intuition here. So we're trying to create a simple mathematical model of how life emerges and expands in the universe. And uh, there's a section in this paper, how many hard steps, question mark. Right. Uh, the two most plausibly diagnostic Earth durations seem to be the one remaining after now before Earth becomes uninhabitable for complex life. So you estimate how long Earth lasts, how many hard steps, there's windows for doing different hard steps, and you can sort of, uh, like queuing theory, mathematically estimate of like uh, the uh, solution or the passing of the hard steps or the taking of the hard steps. Sort of like coldly mathematical look. If life, pre-expansionary life, requires n number of steps, what is the probability of taking those steps on an earth that lasts a billion years or 2 billion years or 5 billion years or 10 billion years? And you say solving for E using the observed durations of 1.1 and 0.4 then gives E values of 3.9 and 12.5, range 5.7 to 26, suggesting a middle estimate of at least six. That's where you said six right. hard steps. Right. 
just to get to where we are. Right. We started at the bottom, now we're here, and that took six steps on average. The key point is, on average, these things on any one random planet would take, you know, trillions or trillions of trillions, you know, of years, just a really long time. And so we're really lucky that they all happened really fast in a short time before our window closed. And the chance of that happening in that short window goes as that time period to the power of the number of steps. And so that was where the power we talked about before came from. And so that means in the history of the universe, we should overall roughly expect advanced life to appear as a power law in time. Mm -hmm. So that very early on, there was very little chance of anything appearing. And then later on, as things appear, other things are appearing somewhat closer to them in time because they're all going as this power law. What is the power law? Can we, for people who are not sure, math inclined, can you right. describe what a power so, law is? So say the function x is linear and x squared is quadratic. So it's the power of two. If we make x to the three, that's cubic or the power of three. And so x to the sixth is the power of six. And so we'd say uh, life appears in the universe on a planet like Earth in that proportion to the time that it's been, you know, uh, ready for life to appear. And that over the universe in general, it'll appear at roughly a power law like that. What is the exponent? What is N? Uh, is it the number of hard steps? Yes, the number of hard steps. So okay, that's so the idea. it's like if you're gambling and you're doubling up every time, this is the probability of you just keep winning. <laughs> uh, so it gets very unlikely very quickly. And so we are the result of this unlikely chain of successes. It's actually a lot like cancer. So the dominant model of cancer in an organism like each of us mm -hmm. is that we have all these cells and in order to become cancerous, a single cell has to go through a number of mutations. And these are very unlikely mutations. And so any one cell is very unlikely to have any have all these mutations happen by the time your lifespan's over. But we have enough cells in our body that the chance of any one cell producing cancer by the end of your life is actually pretty high, more like 40%. And so the chance of cancer appearing in your lifetime also goes as a power law, this power of the number of mutations that's required for any one cell in your body to become cancerous. This is the longer you live, the likely right. you are to have cancer cells. And its and it power is also roughly six. <laughs> that is, the chance of you getting cancer is the roughly the power of six of the time you've been since you were born. It is perhaps not lost on people that you're, <laughs> that you're comparing yes. the power laws of the uh, survival or the arrival of the human species to cancerous cells. It's the same mathematical model, but of course we might have a different value <laughs> assumption yeah. about the two outcomes. But of well, course, from the point of view of cancer, <laughs> it's far <somewhere> similar. <laughs> uh, from the point of view of cancer, it's a win-win. Uh, we both get to We'll both get to thrive, I suppose. Um, it is interesting to take the point of view of all kinds of life forms on Earth, of viruses, of bacteria. They have a very different view. And, and you know, it's like the Instagram channel, um, Nature is Metal. Right. The ethic under which uh, nature operates doesn't often coincide, correlate with human morals. It seems cold and um, machine-like in the selection process that it performs? I am an analyst, I'm a scholar, an intellectual, and I feel I should carefully distinguish predicting what's likely to happen and then evaluating or judging what I think would be better to happen. And it's a little dangerous to mix those up too closely because then we can have wishful thinking. <laughs> And so I try typically to just analyze what seems likely to happen, regardless of whether I like it or whether we do anything about it. And then once you see a rough picture of what's likely to happen if we do nothing, then we can ask, well, what might we prefer? And ask, where could the levers be to, to move it at least a little toward what we might prefer? It's and kinda... that's a you know useful, but often doing that just analysis of what's likely to happen if we do nothing offends many people. <laughs> they find that you know, dehumanizing or cold or metal, as you say, uh, to just say, well, this is what's likely to happen. And, you know, it's not your favorite, sorry, but um, maybe we can do something, but maybe we can't do that much. This is very interesting that the, the cold analysis, whether it's geopolitics, whether it's medicine, 
whether it's economics, sometimes misses some very specific aspect of um, human condition. Like for example, when you look at a doctor and the act of a doctor helping a, a single patient, if you do the analysis of that doctor's time and cost of the medicine or the surgery or the transportation of the patient, this is the Paul Farmer question. You know, is it worth spending 10, 20, $30,000 on this one patient? When you look at all the people that are suffering in the world, that money could be spent so much better. And yet, there's something about human nature that wants to help the person in front of you, and that is actually the right thing to do, despite the analysis. And sometimes when you do the analysis, you um, there's something about the human mind that allows you to not take that leap, that irrational leap uh, to act in this way, that the analysis explains it away. Well, it's like, uh, for example, uh, the US government, you know, the DOT, Department of Transportation, puts a value of, I think, like $9 million on a human life. And the moment you put that number on a human life, you can start thinking, well, okay, I can start making decisions about this or that and with a sort of cold economic perspective. And then you might lose, you might deviate from a deeper truth of what it means to be human somehow. So you have to dance because uh, then, if you put too much weight on the anecdotal evidence on, on these kinds of human emotions, then you're going to lose, uh, you could also probably more likely deviate from truth. But there's something about that cold analysis. Like I've been listening to a lot of people coldly analyze wars, war in Yemen, war in Syria, uh, Israel, Palestine, war in Ukraine, and there's something lost when you do a cold analysis of why something happened. When you talk about energy, uh, 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 talking about sort of conflict, competition over resources. When you uh, talk about geopolitics, sort of models of geopolitics and why a certain war happened, you lose something about the suffering that happens. I don't know. It's an interesting thing because you're both, you're exceptionally good at uh, models in all domains, <laughs> literally. Um, but also there's a humanity to you. Uh, so it's an interesting dance. I don't know if you can comment on that dance. Sure. It's definitely true, as you say, that for many people, if you are accurate in your judgment of, say, for a medical patient, right, what's the chance that this treatment might help? And what's the cost? And compare those to each other. And you might say, this looks like a lot of cost for a small medical gain. And at that point, knowing that fact that might take the wing, you know, the, the air out of your sails, <laughs> you might not be willing to do the thing that maybe you feel is right anyway, which is still to pay for it. Um, and then somebody knowing that might want to keep that news from you, not tell you about the low chance of success or the high cost in order to save you this tension, this, this awkward moment where you might fail to do what they and you think is right. But I think the higher calling, the, the, the higher standard to hold you to, which many people can be held to, is to say, I will look at things accurately, I will know the truth, and then I will also do the right thing with it. I will be at peace with my judgment about what the right thing is in terms of the truth. I don't need to be lied to in order to figure out what the right thing to do is. And I think if you do think you need to be lied to in order to figure out what the right thing to do is, you're at a great disadvantage because then people will be lying to, you will be lying to yourself, and you won't be as effective yes. at achieving whatever good you are trying to achieve. But getting the data, getting the facts is step one, not yes. the final step. Absolutely. So it's, a, I would say, having a good model, getting the good data, is step one and it's a burden because you can't just use that data to um, arrive at sort of the easy convenient thing. You have to really deeply think about what is the right thing. You can't use the, so the, the, the dark aspect of data uh, of models is you can use it to excuse away actions that are unethical. 
You can use data to basically yeah. excuse away anything. But not looking at data lets you excuse worse. yourself to pretend and think that you're exactly. doing good when you're not. Exactly. Uh, but it is, a, it is a burden. It doesn't excuse you from still being human and deeply thinking about what is right. That very kind of gray area, that very subjective area. Um, that's part of the human condition. But let us return for a time to aliens. So you started to define sort of the the model, the parameters of uh, grabbiness, right? Or the uh, as we approach grabbiness. So what happens? So the, again, the, we, there was three parameters. Yes. There's the speed at which they expand. There's the rate at which they appear in time, and that rate has a constant and a power. So we've talked about the history of life on Earth. Suggests that power is around six, but maybe three to twelve. We can say that constant comes from our current date, sort of sets the overall rate. Mm -hmm. And the speed, which is the last parameter, comes from the fact that when we look in the sky, we don't see them. So the model predicts very strongly that if they were expanding slowly, say 1% of the speed of light, our sky would be full of vast spheres that were full of activity. That is, at a random time when a civilization is first appearing, if it looks out into its sky, it would see many other grabby alien civilizations in the sky. And they would be much bigger than the full moon. They'd be huge spheres in the sky. Mm -hmm. And they would be visibly different. We don't see them. Can we pause for a second? Okay. There's a bunch of hard steps that Earth had to pass to arrive at this place we are currently, which we're starting to launch rockets out into space. We're kind of starting to expand. A bit, so right. Very slowly, okay. But this is like the birth. It, it, if you look at the entirety of the history of Earth, we're now at this precipice of like expansion. We could, we might not choose to, but if we do, we will do it in the next 10 million years. 10 million, wow. <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. Uh, I was thinking more like a short a time on the on the cosmological scale. So that that is, it might be only a thousand. But the point is, if it's even if it's up to ten million, that hardly makes any difference to the model. So I might as well give you ten million. This this, <laughs> this makes me feel I was I was so stressed about planning what I'm going to do today, and now right, you got plenty million, of time. Plenty of time. Uh, I just need to be generating some offspring quickly here. Okay. Um, so and there's this moment. <laughs> <laughs> this 10 million uh, year gap uh, or window when we start expanding. And you're saying, okay, so this is an interesting moment where there's a bunch of other alien civilizations that might at some history of the universe arrived at this moment where we're here. They passed all the hard steps. There's a, there's a model for how likely it is that that happens. And then they start expanding. And you think of an expansion as almost like a, a sphere Right. That's a, when you say speed, we're talking about the speed of the radius growth. Exactly. Like the this. surface, how fast the surface how expands. Fast. Okay. And so you're saying that there is some speed for that expansion, average speed, and then we can play with that parameter. And if that speed is super slow, then maybe that explains why we haven't seen anything. If it's super well, fast, well, it would get the slow would create the puzzle. It slow predicts we would see them, but we don't see them. Okay, and so the way to explain that is that they're fast. So the idea is, uh -oh. if they're moving really fast, then we don't see them until they're almost here. And okay, this is counterintuitive. All right, hold on a second. So it's, it, I think this works best when I say a bunch of dumb things. Okay, um, <laughs> and then. Uh, you uh, elucidate the full complexity and the beauty of the dumbness. Okay, so there's these spheres out there in the universe that are made visible because they're sort of uh, using a lot of energy. So they're generating a lot of Doing light stuff. Sound. They're changing stuff. things. They're changing things. And change would be visible a long likely. way off. They, yes. They would take apart stars, rearrange them, restructure galaxies. They, they would do All big, kinds big of huge stuff. Okay. If they're expanding slowly, we would see a lot of them because the universe is old, is relative, is old right. enough to where we would see the that expansion. is. We're assuming we're just typical, in, you know, maybe at the fiftieth percentile of them. So, like half of them have appeared so far; the other half will still appear later. Hmm. And um, the the math of our best estimate is that they appear roughly once per million galaxies, <laughs> and we would meet them in roughly a billion years if uh, we expanded out to meet them. So we're looking at a grabby aliens model, 3D sim. Right. What's, what's this, that's the actual name of the video. What, uh, by the time we get to 13.8 billion years, the fun begins. 
Okay, so this is this is um right. we're watching a three dimensional sphere rotating. I presume that's the universe, and then right. crappy aliens are expanding and filling that universe exactly with all kinds of uh, and of then fun. pretty soon it's all full. It's full. So that's how the grabby aliens come in contact, first of all, with other aliens, and then um, with us humans. The following is a simulation of the grabby aliens model of alien civilizations. Civilizations are born that expand outwards at constant speed. A spherical region of space is shown. By the time we get to 13.8 billion years, this sphere will be about 3,000 times as wide as the distance from the Milky Way to Andromeda. Okay, this is fun. It's huge. Okay, it's huge. Um, all right. So why don't we see, uh, we're, we're one little tiny, 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 tiny dot in that giant, giant sphere. Right. Uh, why don't we see any of the grabby aliens? It depends on how fast they expand. So you could see that if they expanded at the speed of light, you wouldn't see them until they were here. Uh, so like out there, if somebody is destroying the universe with a uh, vacuum decay, there's this, there's this, you know, doomsday scenario where somebody somewhere could change the vacuum of the universe and that would expand at the speed of light and basically destroy everything it hit. But you'd never see that until it got here because it's expanding at the speed of light. If you're expanding really slow, then you see it from a long way off. So the fact we don't see anything in the sky tells us they're expanding fast, say over a third the speed of light. And that's really, really fast. But that's what you have to believe if we look out and you don't see anything. Now you might say, well, how? maybe I just don't wanna believe this whole model. Why should I believe this whole model at all? And our best evidence why you should believe this model is our early date. We are right now at almost 14 billion years into the universe on a planet around a star that's roughly 5 billion years old. But the average star out there will last roughly five trillion years. <laughs> that is a thousand times longer. And remember that power law, it says that the chance of advanced life appearing on a planet goes as the power of sixth of the time. So if a planet lasts a thousand times longer, then the chance of it appearing on that planet, if everything would stay empty at least, is a thousand to the sixth power or 10 to the 18. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> enormous overwhelming chance that if the universe would just stay sit and empty and waiting for advanced life to appear, when it would appear would be way at the end of all these planet lifetimes. That is the long planets near the end of the lifetime, trillions of years into the future. So, but we're really early compared to that. And our explanation is at the moment, as you saw in the video, the universe is filling up in roughly a billion years, it'll all be full. And at that point, it's too late for advanced life to show up. So you had to show up now before that deadline. Okay, can, can we break that apart a little bit? Okay, or linger on some of the things you said. So with the power law, the things we've done on Earth, the model you have says that it's very unlikely. Like we're lucky SOBs. Is that is that mathematically right. correct to say? We, we're crazy early. That so is when early means like in the history of the universe. In the history, of the, okay. So, given this model, how do we make sense of that? If we're super, right. can we just be the lucky ones? Well, okay. ten to the eighteen lucky. You know, yeah. how, how lucky do you feel? Uh, <laughs> so you know, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty lucky, right? You know, ten to the eighteen is is a billion billion. So then, if you were just being honest and humble, that that means. What does that mean? It means uh, one of the assumptions that calculated this crazy early must be wrong. Yeah, That's what it means. So the key assumption we suggest is that the universe would stay empty. So most life would appear like a thousand times longer later than now yeah. if everything would stay empty waiting for it to appear. What, what is, so what is non-empty So the grabby exactly? aliens are filling the universe right now, roughly at the moment they filled half of the universe and they've changed it. And when they fill everything, it's too late for stuff like us to appear. But wait, hold on a second. Did anyone help us get lucky? If it's so difficult, what, how do, uh, like, what? So it's like cancer, right? <laughs> There's all these cells, each of which randomly does or doesn't get cancer. And eventually some cell gets cancer and, you know, we were one of those. <laughs> but hold on a second. Okay. But we got it early. Early, early compared to the prediction with an assumption that's wrong. That's so that's how we do a lot of, you know, 
theoretical analysis, you have a model that makes a prediction that's wrong, then that helps you reject that model. Okay, let's try to understand exactly where the wrong is. So the assumption is that the universe is empty. Stays empty. Stays empty. And, and waits until this advanced life appears in trillions of years. That is, if the universe would just stay empty, if there was just, you know, nobody else out there, yeah. then when you should expect advanced life to appear, if you're the only one in the universe, when should you expect to appear? You should expect to appear trillions of years in the future. I see, right, right. So this is a very sort of nuanced mathematical uh, assumption. I, I don't think we can intuit it cl cleanly with words, uh, but if you assume that you're just wait, the universe stays empty and you're waiting for one life uh, civilization to pop up, then it's gonna, it should happen very late, much right. later than now. And the, uh, if you look at Earth, uh, the way things happen on Earth, it happened much, 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 much earlier than it was supposed to, according to this model, if you take the initial assumption. Therefore, you can say, well, the initial assumption of the universe staying empty is very unlikely. Right. So, okay. And the other, the other alternative theory is the universe is filling up and will fill up soon. And yeah. so we are typical for the origin date of things that can appear before the deadline. Before the deadline. Okay, it's filling up. So why don't we see anything if it's filling up? Because they're expanding really fast. Close to the speed of light. Exactly. So we will only see it when it's here. Almost here. Okay. Uh, what are the ways in which we might see a quickly expanding? <laughs> this, this is both exciting and terrifying. <laughs> it is terrifying. It's like watching a truck like driving at you at 100 miles an hour. And uh, right. So we would see spheres in the sky, at least one sphere in the sky, yeah. growing very rapidly. And like you know, very uh, rapidly. Right. <laughs> yes, very rapidly. So, so we're not, so there's, there's you know, different, because we were just talking about 10 million right. years. This would be... You might see it 10 million years in advance coming. I mean, you still might have a long warning. We're, we're, again, oh, the universe is 14 billion years old. <laughs> the typical origin times of these things are spread over several billion years. So the chance of one originating at a, you know, very close to you in time is very low. So th they still might take millions of years from the time you see it, from the time it gets here. Yeah, You'll have a million years of your ears to be terrified of this well, fast fear coming at you. But, but but coming at you very fast, so if they're traveling yes. close to the speed of light. But they're coming from a long way away. So remember, the rate at which they appear is one per million galaxies. Right. So they're, they're roughly 100 galaxies away. I see, so the delta between the speed of light and their actual travel speed is very important. Right, so if they're going at, say, half the speed of light. We'll have a long time. Then, to, yeah. But what if they're traveling exactly at a speed of light? So then we see them like. Then we, then we wouldn't have much warning, but that's less likely. Well, we, we can't exclude it. And they could also be somehow traveling faster than the speed of light. Or that I think we can't exclude, because if they could go faster than the speed of light, then they would just already be everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. in, a, in a universe where you can travel faster than the speed of light, you can go backwards in space-time. So any time you appeared anywhere in space-time, you could just fill up everything. Yeah, and... So I anybody mean, in the future, whoever appeared, they, they would have been here by now. Can you exclude the possibility that those kinds of aliens aren't already here? Uh, well, you have we should have model. a different discussion of that. Right, okay. so, well, so let's actually <laughs> leave that, let's leave that discussion aside okay. just to linger and understand the grabby alien expansion, which is beautiful and fascinating. Okay. So there's these giant expanding spheres, uh, spheres of alien civilizations. Now, um, when those spheres spheres collide, mathematically, it was, it's very likely that we're not the first collision of grabby of alien civilizations. I suppose is one way to say it. So there's like the first time the spheres touch each other, recognize each other. Right. They meet. Um, they they recognize each other first before they meet. Um, they see each other coming. They see each other coming, and then so there's a bunch of them. There's a, there's a combinatorial thing where they start seeing each other coming, and then there's a, a third neighbor. It's like what the hell? And then there's a fourth one. Okay, right. so what does that you think look like? Um, what lessons from human nature? That's the only data we have. Uh, well, can you draw so, so the, the story of the history of the universe here yes. is what I would call a living cosmology. So what I'm 
excited about in part by this model is that it lets us tell a story of cosmology where there are actors who have agendas. So most ancients, peoples, they had cosmologies, the stories they told about where the universe came from and where it's going and what's happening out there. And their stories, they like to have agents and actors, gods or something out there doing things. And lately, our favorite cosmology is dead, kind of boring. <laughs> you know, we're the only activity we know about or see and everything else just looks dead and, and empty. Yeah. But this is now telling us, no, that's not quite right. <laughs> At the moment, the universe is filling up and in a few billion years, it'll be all full. And from then on, the history of the universe will be the universe full of aliens. Yeah, so that's a, it's a really good reminder, a really good way to think about cosmologies. We're surrounded by a vast darkness, and we don't know what's going on in that darkness until the light from whatever generate lights arrives here. So we kind of, yeah, we look up at the sky, okay, there's stars, oh, they're pretty, but you don't think about the giant expanding spheres of aliens. <laughs> right, because you don't <laughs> that are quick, see them, but, that are but now our approaching. date, the, looking at the clock, if you're clever, the clock tells you. So I like the analogy with the ancient Greeks. So yes. you might think that an ancient Greek, you know, staring at the universe couldn't possibly tell how far away the sun was or how far away the moon is or how big the earth is that all you can see is just big things in the sky you can't tell. But they were clever enough, actually, to be able to figure out the size of the Earth and the distance to the moon and the sun and the size of the moon and sun. That is, they could figure those things out, actually, by being clever enough. And so similarly, we can actually figure out where are the aliens out there in space-time by being clever about the few things we can see, one of which is our current date. And so now that you have this living cosmology, we can tell the story that the universe starts out empty, and then at some point, things like us appear, very primitive, and then some of those just stop being quiet and expand. And then for a few billion years, they expand, and then they meet each other. And then for the next hundred billion years, they commune with each other. <laughs> that is, the usual models of cosmology say that in roughly 100, 150 billion years, the expansion of the universe will happen so much that all you'll have left is some galaxy clusters and they, that are sort of disconnected from each other. But before then, for the next 100 million years, 100 billion years, excuse me, um, they will interact. There will be this community of all the grabby alien civilizations and each one of them will hear about and even meet thousands of others. And we might hope to join them someday and become part of that community. That's an interesting thing to aspire to.